Giulio Cavallo, and I am sorry if I always mispronounced uh, his name before, but I think I have it good. First encountered the Spiritist Doctrine when he was about 14 years old. Since then, he has become an active participant in the United States Spiritist Movement. He has co-founded the Spiritist Center Divine Light in Newark, New Jersey, which he coordinates with a group of friends and has become a prolific speaker. Wonderful informationalist. While disseminating the Spiritist message not only in the tri-state area, but also in the Union County Jail, where he works as a mental health counselor. It's a wonderful, wonderful uh, experience for those who are in need. So today, Julia will talk to us about the wealthy individual. Please welcome Julio Cavallo. Thank you. <clears throat> Everyone, let's begin by wishing peace in our hearts. Usually, I am given this part of the day to speak. Maybe I should ask you to stand up, because now that you're well fed and listening to classical music, maybe I should stand up here and do some comedy. So I will pick back on my good friend Susanna Simons by starting with the story of a wise man. Now mind you that this is the same wise man all along. <laughs> the same individual. Before I say that, I also want to express my gratitude for being invited to participate in this event. I find it extremely important that we hear. This is the unification of the two Spiritist Federation together with the national entity. We all work together to disseminate this wonderful philosophy that has done so much in our lives. And although we might not see it as an important event, in the future, we'll look back and we'll celebrate those who have the wisdom to participate in such events. So after the wise man left Susanna's stories, he came to my world, and this is what he taught. One day he was traveling with his disciples from city to city. And they approached this particular city where most people were poor. And they found an abandoned farm. They thought the farm was abandoned because the barbed wire around the farm was missing. There was the small house in the middle of the farm where the roof was missing. There was gigantic hole on the wall. There were no plantations of any kind, no rice, no beans, no corns. And obviously, they thought the house was empty. But as the wise man with his disciples approached that little house, they were surprised that out of that little house, four individuals came out, a mother, a father, and two kids. Both kids were barefoot, shirtless. The father, he was so skinny, he was definitely ill. And the woman, her hair was all over the place. You can tell a family financial status by the woman's hairstyle. It's all over the place you can deduce they're in a bad condition. So the wise man approached the father and asked him, how is life? And he said, 
I hate my life. I'm miserable. And the wise man asked, why? And he said, do you see that cow over there? And he pointed to the cow who was so far that it actually looked like a cat. It's a visual illusion. And if you're starving, imagine what the cow was going through. He said, our existence depends on the existence of our cow. My kids, they walk the cow. My wife, she washes the cow. And I milk the cow. And as you can see, there are no grass for the cow to eat. Therefore, we are all starving. And that's why I hate my life. The wise man looked at the individual, his entire family, and his disciples, and said, I wish you well. I'll come back in a couple of years. He started to walk with his disciples towards the cow. And you know how animals, they sense the presence of human beings. So the cow got scared and she continued to walk further and further away from her home. By the time they reached the cow, they were so far away that they could barely see the home. So the wise men said, let's make this cow disappear. And the disciples asked him, are you crazy? Are you out of your mind? You just heard the man saying that the family depends on the existence of his cow. And you want us to disappear with the cow? Yes, let's take her to the wilderness. So they did, and the cow disappeared. The disciples thought the wise men were very mean. Four years went by, and here comes the same wise man with the same disciples. And they arrived at the same city, and the farm was completely changed. Brand new barbed wire around fencing the farm. They could see plantations of all kinds, corns, rice, and beans. And the house was all fixed up. Brand new roof and no cracks on the wall. And obviously the disciples thought someone else bought this farm, fixed it up, and threw the family out. But for their surprise, here comes the four same individuals. The two kids had shoes on and book bags. They were not just walking a cow, they were going to school now. The man looked strong, healthy, and the woman <laughs> had fixed her hair. She had a nice dress on. So the wise man approached the father again and asked him, how is life? And the man said, I love my life. What happened? Well, I have no idea what took place, but due to a coincidence, the last time I saw you guys was also the last time I saw my cow. <laughs> we starved for a couple of days, and then I used some of the money we had saved up, and I bought some food, and then we started starving again. And I realized if we just went through our money, then we wouldn't have anything to buy with. I had to come up with an alternative, and I did. I bought some seeds, and little did I know how fertile our ground was. In just a couple of months, we had beans, corn, tomatoes, potatoes, and we were eating good. We became strong, and now we had enough to plant so we can sell those vegetables. We had enough money now to buy other cows, sell the milk, fix the house, put a new fence on, and life is beautiful. So the wise man turns to his disciples and said, the problem with the majority of us is not that we aim so high and we miss it. It's because we aim so low and we hit it. We are capable of so much more, yet we settle for less. Now, in spiritism, for someone that is new to this information and misunderstands what it's all about, they might draw the wrong conclusion that in order to be evolved, one must be poor. It seems that it's almost a curse to be rich. 
But in the Spirit's book, and what is the Spirit's book? I know all of you here know what the Spirit's book is. Let me open a parenthesis in our conversation. I don't know if this happens with my friends, but to me, it is very challenging to prepare a lecture for this kind of occasion. And why? Because it is so unknown who will be listening to us. You see, if you're a math teacher, you prepare a math class. You know the student's age, you know what they're looking for, you know what they have done and what they need to do. In a regular spiritist lecture, if this was tomorrow, Sunday, where you have your regular lectures, we know exactly what to say. We have an idea because we assume that most of you who are here have heard to this stuff before. But when it comes to an English event in which we have no idea who will show it up, we have to be concerned not to give too much information to someone who's new and at the same time not bore the people who are here with too basic information. So what do we do? Well, I like to choose the people who are new. And why? Because I strongly believe that our commitment to this philosophy is to disseminate to those who haven't heard of it. And all of us have a duty, a duty to disseminate this philosophy. I heard it from our beloved Divaldo Franco. We were in a meeting with Divaldo in a small center that I used to attend approximately 19 years ago. And a friend of mine came up to him and said, Divaldo, a bunch of my friends have returned to Brazil and I'm still here. Why? And Divaldo said, well, that's because you have not yet paid all your debts to this country. He said, this is Divaldo, I'm quoting, most of us, referring to Brazilians, we are ex-slave owners who were expelled from our country of orange, went to Brazil to reestablish ourselves again psychologically and come back to the country where we have done much harm. And when you look at the resemblance of pain that immigrants go through here, and slaves did back then, it makes a lot of sense. Slaves were obligated to leave their loved ones. Some of us have left loved ones. Slaves came here to do hard work. A lot of people left comfortable jobs to do here hard work. And then he said that we have a chance to disseminate in light what we have spread in darkness if we popularize this beautiful philosophy, spiritism. And I truly wish we, it, we can all embrace this idea because we don't learn in spiritism that we must suffer to correct the wrongdoings what we have done. What we learn is that we must do good so our good repairs the mistakes that we have done. And spreading this philosophy, doing good, in teaching others how to well live will definitely repair our negative acts from our previous existences. We are living in a very special moment in history. And I truly wish and I pray to our community, which is the Spiritist community, that we embrace this idea. I must say that there are some people who are watching our lecture from live Facebook. 
And some of these people, they say, I'll be there in spirit. Well, if Pope McCartney was playing here in the stadium, they wouldn't be there in spirit, would they? <laughs> Maybe I should say if Yvette Sangalo came here for a concert, they would be at the concert in spirit, would they? They will go there physically, in their flesh. But at the Spirit Center, we go there in spirit. Now, for those of you who could come here physically, if you live 20 miles from here and you didn't, I'm sorry to say that you're not getting the benefits, the spiritual benefits of this meeting. Because if you have a choice and you don't come, I feel very sorry for you. It's a special moment that we can exchange energy, exchange fraternity, be together with one another. We are family. You see, when it comes to spiritist teachings, we learn about charity and doing good works. And we have this idea that to do charity is to give soup to people. Now, that is one form of charity, and according to the spirits, specifically the gospel according to spiritism, chapter 15, without charity there is no salvation. You have material and spiritual charity. Spiritual charity is more difficult to perform, therefore there is more merit to it. Sitting down here and supporting this cause is an act of charity. Some say, I'm not going there because I don't speak English. Okay, but you still can vibrate positive emotions of love. I'm digressing for, from the, our main topic here, and I apologize. But to me, I'm very passionate about this issue, about disseminating spiritism in English. So they say, I don't speak English. Well, but if you sit in one of these chairs, someone that is here for the first time, by seeing that the room is full of people, they will go home thinking, at least on a subconscious level, there's a lot of people who likes this stuff. They liked it, I didn't understand. But when they find empty seats and they come, their assumption is these people, they are out of their minds. The stuff that they're talking about. And, and the people who tells me that they don't speak English, sometimes they have been here for 20 years. I don't know if I strangle them <laughs> or I should carefully listen to them. They have been here for 20 years. The least they can do is speak the language. And then they read Nosolar in Portuguese, of course. If someone comes to them, they say, I don't speak English. Okay. But they read Nasolar. And they're so confident when they will die, where they're going? To Nasolar. Now, read it. Nasolar, when it was written in the year, uh, in the 1940s, there were one million residents in Nasolar. One million. The world right now, it's 7.3 billion people. What that means, if there are one million spirits in each spiritual colony, there are approximately 7,000 spiritual colonies throughout the world. So if you die here, you're not going to be taken to Brazil, not so large. <laughs> a spirit, a local spirit, will come to you and says, can I help you? And what are you going to say? I don't speak English. <laughs> it's laughable, I know, but it's true. You know, I have a friend of my mother's. He went for his citizenship. And these are the sort of people that are here for 20 years, but never learn anything about the country. You know, we're not citizens of Brazil, we're not citizens of the US, we are citizens of the world. And temporarily we're placed here to do our best here. Some of these people, they are here forever and they don't even care about learning the culture. So 
he's preparing for his citizenship and he memorizes everything. And when you memorize this stuff without understanding, it's terrible. So he goes in for his interview and the officer asks him, who was the first president of the United States? And he said, George Washington Bridge. <laughs> <laughs> it's true. <laughs> in, in the Northeast, we have George Washington Bridge. And that's how he memorized it. You know, even the officer laughed at him. The least we can do is to learn the language. Some people, they say to me, you know, in our motherland, and I ask them, what are you referring about? A patria mãe in our motherland. What are you referring about? I'm referring about Brazil. Uh-huh. If that's your motherland, then we should consider the US your stepmother. <laughs> Imagine how the stepmother will feel. <laughs> the mother didn't care about you. She left you, right? And then the stepmother said, come, I'll receive you with open arms. I will take care of you. I will provide. I'll give you the means by which you can develop yourself, financially, materially. And then we say, you're not my mother? Isn't that what we're saying? This mentality of absorbing the best that this land has to offer with, without giving second thought, what am I contributing to live here? It's a very selfish thought. We haven't understand the opportunity of why are we here. If we did, we would do much more for our movement. Take, for example, the event that happens in Florida. I heard there were 600 people in that event. I love it. Great. The speakers who were there, the preparation, fantastic. I consider those individuals my teachers. I learned from them. And our event, our English spiritist event, how many people we had? Numbers are not per se a measure of quality. I know that. But to me, it's a measurement of investment. How much investment do we do in our English movement? And I'll refer to investment, I mean by time, money, and enthusiasm. You guys are not here for us. We are unknown. We are here for ourselves because we have understood the better path. So to give our enthusiasm, our time, we are investing in our own happiness. Maybe we're searching for someone to give soup. Go ahead, continue giving your soup, donate your money, your clothes. But according to the spirits, giving of ourselves has more merit. We are here. The material charity is scheduled for Sunday at 10 o'clock. What is Sunday at 10 o'clock in the morning? That's when we give the soup. That's when we give clothes to the poor. Go ahead, continue doing it. But spiritual charity can be done at any moment without anyone knowing that we're doing it. If I give soup to someone, the individual receiving my help, he says, oh, you are my angel. And from the psychological point of view, that is a great massage to our ego which is excellent. That's how we stimulate one another to continue doing good, and we should praise people for doing good things. But spiritual charity, no one has seen it. Only those who can really make a difference in your lives. 
with your guardian angel, God, Jesus, being here. What are we doing? We're sharing what we have to offer. I'm not there to only absorb from the lectures the knowledge. I'm there to give of myself. If we truly believe the material we read on, on the Andrea Louise's work, on the Spirit's book, we know there's lots of work being done right now. Our animal fluid, in Alan Kardec's terms, the ectoplasm, is being drawn from each one of us to help spirits who are in trouble right now, who are sick, so they need this matter. We are donating. We are taking advantage of this opportunity. So please, help us out. Embrace it. Spread the word. If you see English videos on spiritism, spread it. We are passionately trying to do this work in this land because it's where Jesus has planted us. It's where we should blossom as individuals. But before my time is up, let me cover the topic which I'm here for. <clears throat> the wealth individuals. Thank you, Josara. The wealth individual. You know, we have an intrinsic need to be better. If you study the Spirit's book, there is the law of conservation. In the law of conservation, God has made material things for us pleasing to our senses. And why? So we can better ourselves. If we study paleoanthropology, this is the science they study old fossils. You know, we started with the evolution of our body. Through being a homo erectus, we were sort of chimpanzees living on trees, hominids. And it was because of a need to better our physical conditions that we dropped from that tree and we started walking the savannas of Africa. And because the savannas had tall grasses, we forced ourselves to stand up to look over the savannas. And that action, that repeated movement of standing up made us homo erectus. And then because we needed to improve our material conditions, we searched for food, for better food, not just leaves, because our brain needed to grow. Hunger for protein, and we started killing animals. But animals are so fast, how are we going to get better food? Then we created weapons. We found some stones. We were able to cut these stones. We manipulated matter, and now we became homo abilis, with the ability of cutting stones, placing them in woods, and making weapons out of them. It was out of a need to better ourselves. About 15,000 years ago, the greatest invention of all times took place, and that is the discovery of agriculture. Finally, we're able to stay in the same place. We're not food gatherers anymore. We're not just walking from place to place searching for food. We could plant the food and now stay. And we needed to transport the food. We need water. So now the great civilizations on Earth are born around the rivers. China around Yang Tsing China, uh, Egypt around the Nile River. Now we're able to construct houses. If we didn't have anything that we produced, that was bad weather that year, we now had a means to exchange our goods without having any good. That's how money was born. A need to better ourselves. And this constant need in finding in matter very pleasing, we're now living in this modern world society. Now, just in case, as Homo erectus, we're still living on trees and in caves, and we dialed and Chinese food was ordered, and pizza was delivered, guess what would have happened? We'll still be living in caves. It's a need to better ourselves, and that need not simply given to us, but worked for it, is the means to progress, to evolve. So we need financial difficulties because those financial difficulties are the driving force for us to develop ourselves 
intellectually. What Spiritism teaches is that being rich is not wrong. Being possessed by what we have, that's not wise. It's unhealthy for us. The more we are attached to something, the harder will be the detachment from what we think we possess. Because the things that are under our temporary management, we have to leave them behind. When someone dies, what it says on their will, I will leave my car to my brother. I will leave my house to my wife. I will leave my farm to my sister. The verb used is I will leave. It's not I will give. Why are they living? Because they can't take it with them. Our coffin has no drawers that we could put the stuff there and take it to the spiritual world. Therefore, to be rich, that is not the aim, purpose of our lives. We should better ourselves materially, but that should not be the sole purpose of our existence. Is when we place in material things, all of our hopes, all of our happiness, that's where we'll be very frustrated. Because what we're looking for in material things will not provide to us. Dr. Deaton, he was the uh, Nobel Prize for Economics in the year 2016. And he wrote a book called The Great Scape. And in this book, he says that when we are poor, Material things can bring us temporary happiness. But once we reach the mark of $70,000, more money does not add happiness to our state of mind. As a matter of fact, there are so many people who crave to win the lottery. Have you seen the show on Money Channel called The Curse of the Lottery? They wish they never had won that kind of money. About a year or so, people who win the lottery, they become as miserable as they were before. I am not saying money, it's a bad thing. It's how we use money. By using in a positive way, it's a source of progress. Emmanuel, in the book Money, he says, money is the blood of our society. Referring to society as being the body and money being the blood. Our body cannot function without blood. Therefore, our society cannot function without money. It's through money that we cause material progress. One of the richest men, as a matter of fact, the second richest man in the U.S., Andrew Carnegie, this man, he had a philosophy of life. He would spend 30% of his life studying, another 30% amassing wealth, and another 30% distributing that same wealth. I love the story that it was Edwin Hubble, the man who discovered overnight that we are not just this galaxy. There are an infinite amount of galaxies out there. The numbers right now are ranging from 300 to 400 billion galaxies on our universe. But back in the year 1925, Edwin Hubble discovered the first star in a different galaxy. By the time of Edwin Hubble, our entire universe was just our own tiny galaxy, the Milky Way galaxy. But because the money donated from Andrew Carnegie, he was able to build a telescope in California and discover other galaxies. In our modern times, we have the story of Elon Musk, this man, he asked his father for $28,000. With that money, he builds a platform for magazine and newspapers to publish their work. He sells that, and now he creates a different platform for money exchange, and that's PayPal. He sells PayPal, makes a fortune, about $13 billion. Now, does he go and buy a, 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 his private island and rests? No, the man has the mentality to change the world. He creates SpaceX, Tesla, the car. He's revolutionizing how we live in our modern life and how he's doing that with persistence, hard work, and money. 
But money is an instrument. It's not our aim. We are not here in the US as immigrants for the simple purpose of getting wealth. There is another kind of wealth that is more important, and that is spiritual wealth because it's everlasting. Material wealth needs to be transferred from hands to hands. It's impossible to keep in our hands forever. And this is why we have the natural phenomenon of death. But spiritual wealth, what we acquire, stays with us forever. The patience you gain to get today, the resilience, the perseverance, comprehension, these are spiritual values. Humbleness, humility, those are true treasures of the spirit. Knowledge, that is having real wealth. There is an image that can help us discern for ourselves. If we're investing more time in gaining material wealth, which is fast fleeting, or we are dedicating ourselves to build our spiritual wealth. And that is the image of the cross. The cross has many symbols. And one of them is that the cross can stand because the vertical pole is bigger than the horizontal pole. The vertical pole is the spiritual wealth. The material pole is the material ambition. Now, let's say we give more importance. We switched our focus. And we give more importance to material wealth than to spiritual ambition. What would happen? The cross, the horizontal cross would be much larger. The vertical cross much shorter and the individual will fall with the weight of the cross and will suffocate himself. We work to get money and nourish our body, but if we're not giving any attention to our spirit, our spirit will starve, hence diseases of the spirit, anxiety, depression, happiness, frustration. Let's make money and change our physical surroundings. But beyond that, let's invest the wealth of intelligence, the wealth of our health, and most importantly, the wealth of time in amassing knowledge, morality, so we can conquer ourselves and be truly owners of our future. And the spiritist knowledge has so much information to help us to achieve that goal. I apologize for my rather long introduction, but I felt was necessary because to me it's a unique opportunity to address my friends and those who are watching us from Facebook Live. Thank you so much for your attention.